السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام. الحمد لله في رب العالمين. والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. اللهم إنا نسألك أن تجعلنا ممن إذا أعطي شكر وإذا ابتلي صبر وإذا أذنب استغفر. Allah, we ask you to make us from amongst those that if they are given, they are grateful. If they are tested, they are patient. And if they commit sin, then they turn to you seeking your forgiveness. Because these are the ingredients of success in this life as well as in the hereafter. The topic that we're going to talk about today, inshallah ta'ala, in Arabic is Dhabta Nafs, self-accountability and having self-control, self-discipline, um, which equals self-improvement. The more you work on trying to hold yourself accountable, the better you become. Um, self-discipline is one of the most extraordinary qualities of the believer. All throughout the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the believer in terms of him holding himself accountable. And this quality distinguishes the believer who excels or desire to be greater than the average ordinary Muslim who settles for mediocrity in his deen. The believer is autonomous, meaning he has authority and control over his own self. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَكُلُّ إِنسَانٍ أَلْزَمْنَاهُ طَائِرَهُ فِي عُنْهِ that every human being we have tied his fate to his own neck. Meaning you are responsible for where you go in this life as well as in the hereafter. You are responsible for yourself. A lot of times as Muslims, we look to our sheikh, our imam, someone greater than us to um, you know, put the blame on, so to say. You know, what my sheikh told me, what my imam told me. You know, no, it's you are responsible for you. And we can't blame anyone or any particular individual for um, our downfall or our failure um, if in fact we fall victim to that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a very beautiful ayah in the Quran. الأعمال الموصلة إليه وهذه الآية 
أصل في محاسبة العبد نفسه وحرمان كل حرمان أن يغفل العبد عن هذا عن هذا الأمر ويشابه قوم نسوا الله وغفلوا عن ذكره والقيام بحقه سبحانه وتعالى وأقبلوا على حظوظ أنفسهم وشهواتهم فلم ينجو فلم ينجو من عذاب الله Imam Sa'adi is tafsir of this ayah. He said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding the human beings or the commanding the believers to look towards the hereafter. Malahum wa ma'alihim. What deeds will be for you on the day of judgment and what deeds will be against you on the day of judgment. He said that when the servant makes the hereafter, nasba a'yunihim places the hereafter at the top of his priorities, then this will propel him, uh, as well as he used the word qibla to him. And this is from the eloquence of the Arabic language. I don't even know how to translate that, to be honest with you. Um, I guess the direction of your heart, all right, if I could use that. And for those of you who understand Arabic, you understand better what that means. Um, and you put you know, this at the top of your priorities, and you begin to work towards the deeds that will make your home and the hereafter better for you and easy for you. He said, this verse is a asl, it is the founding principle as it relates to what is called muhasaba. Muhasaba, which is self-accountability. The servant holding himself accountable. He said, al-hurman, kullu hurman, and the epitome of deprivation is that the servant is negligent as it relates to holding himself accountable and begins to satisfy his every urge and desire and he forgets about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as a result of that he is not successful in the hereafter. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala he said as he commented on this ayah he said al-mu'min qawwamun ala nafsihi yuhasibu nafsahu lillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala wa innama خف الحساب يوم القيامة على قوم حاسبوا أنفسهم في الدنيا وإنما شق الحساب يوم القيامة على قوم أخذوا هذا الأمر من غير محاسبة انتهى كلامه رحمه الله تعالى ابن القيم رحمه الله تعالى said that the believer قوام على نفسه the believer is autonomous and he has control over himself and he works towards correcting himself doesn't wait for somebody outside of himself. A lot of times, we wait for other people to correct us instead of doing it yourself. And then when someone corrects you, you say, yeah, you know, I know, brother, I know. If you know, then correct it. Why wait for someone outside of yourself to correct you when you can do it yourself? The believer is kawamun ala nafsi. He has authority over his own self. And whoever holds himself accountable in this life then his accountability in the hereafter will be easy. But whoever does not hold himself accountable in this life, lives life very freely, then his hisab, his accountability on the Day of Judgment will be shadeen, will be very difficult. كتب عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله تعالى عنه وكان أشد الناس محاسبة على نفسه حتى قال أنس بن مالك رضي الله تعالى عنه سمعت عمر يوما وقد خرجت معه حتى دخل حائطا فسمعته يقول وبيني وبينه جدران وهو في جوف الحائط يقول عمر بن الخطاب أمير المؤمنين بخ بخ والله يا ابن الخطاب لا تتقين الله أو لا يعذب لك الله عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله تعالى عنه and he was one of the most serious people when it came to holding himself accountable because that's the last thing you think about a dialogue with himself and holding himself accountable. Anas, he narrates to us an incident between him and Umar bin al-Khattab He said, I went out with Umar one day and he went to go relieve himself. And between me and him, there was a wall, partition. He said, I could hear Umar, but I couldn't see him behind the wall. And he was talking to himself. He said to himself, Amir al-Mu'minin, bakhin, bakhin. He said, leader of the believers, you're right. He said, oh, Ibn al-Khattab, you are going to fear Allah, or Allah is going to punish you. Intimate dialogue with himself. He's talking to himself. He's talking to himself. 
Ibn Khattab, you are either going to fear Allah or Allah is going to punish you. Talking to himself. How many of us have that type of relationship with ourselves? These type of topics, it's not important to people who don't have that relationship with their own selves. We live in a time where people bury their souls under a lot of superficial facade. And you begin to believe that because I'm this or that and people look at me as this and that, you begin to believe in yourself that you are that. As opposed to realizing that you are nothing more than a slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Abdullah bin Mubarak rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Adam insana ya'lam annahu abd. Fa'idha alima annahu abd, fal ya'lam annahu mawkuf. يعني بين يدي الله سبحانه وتعالى فإذا علم أنه موقوف فليعلم أنه مسؤول فإذا علم أنه مسؤول فليعد فليعد لكل جواب سواء سؤال جواب he said that it's upon the servant the the individual to realize that you are nothing more than a servant of Allah سبحانه وتعالى and if you realize that you are nothing more than a servant to Allah سبحانه وتعالى then you must know that you are موقوف that you are going to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you know that you are going to stand before Allah, then you should also know that you are going to be questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you know that you're going to be questioned, then prepare for every question a response. But Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu he wrote a letter, ila ba'di ummali. Some of the people who used to work for him, governors that he placed in different positions, he would write them letters advising them. So on one occasion, he wrote them a letter, and at the end of the letter, he said, "An hasib nafsika fi raqa qabla hisab al shidda, fa innu man hasib nafsahu fi raqa qabla hisab al shidda aada marjiuhu ila rida, wa wa man alhatu hayatu." وَشَغَلَتْهُ أَهْوَاءُهُ عَادَ أَمْرُهُ إِلَى النِّدَامَةِ وَخُسْرَانِ Umar, he wrote a letter to his workers, people that were underneath him, that worked for him, governors, people that he put over position, over people. He wrote to them a letter and he said, حَاسِبْ نَفْسَكَ فِي الرَّخَى قَبْلَ إِسَابِ الشِدَّةِ Hold yourself accountable while things are easy before there comes a time where your accountability is given for you when things are going to be difficult for you. Hold yourself accountable for rakhah, when things are easy. Hold yourself accountable before the heavy accountability in the hereafter. He said, because it is easy for a person to hold himself accountable today than to wait till yawm al-qiyamah and hold yourself accountable then. He said, whoever holds himself accountable now, then your end result will be prosperity and you'll be happy. He said, well, whoever lets himself go and follows his every desire, then your accountability in the hereafter will be very difficult. We have to learn how to be, brothers and sisters, spiritually disciplined and holding ourselves accountable and spiritually responsible for ourselves and not leaving our accountability to be in the hands of other people. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, something very important here, he said, al-muhasaba thalathatu arakan. He said that holding yourself accountable, it has three pillars. I want you brothers and sisters to play, you know, pay close attention. Because, ala sulb al-mubu'ah, come on, you call it. This is the meat and potatoes of the subject matter. He said, al-muhasaba thalathatu arakan. That holding self-accountability, it has three, it has three pillars. He said, الركن الأول أن تقايس بين نعمتك وجنايتك يعني أن تقايس بين ما من الله وما منك فإن إذا يظهر لك التفاوت في هذه المقايسة تعلم حقيقة نفسك. ابن القيم رحمه الله تعالى said that self accountability has three uh, three pillars. The first is to compare the ni'mah, the blessing that Allah has given you to the sins that you commit. Compare the blessings that Allah has given you to the sins that you commit. Wallah al we could stop right now. Wallah al if I said nothing else for the rest of this lecture, how do you feel? 
Yak fina. He said, compare the blessing that Allah has given you to the sins that you commit. He said, and when you do this, he said, it will become clear who you really are. Whether you're grateful or whether you're ungrateful. You don't need anybody to tell you you're ungrateful or you're grateful. You don't need anybody to tell you that. You can do the math on your own. Compare the ni'mah of Allah to the sins that you commit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us eyesight to see the truth. And you sit al haq to see the truth. To see the things that are pleasing to him. And we use it for just about everything other than that. Which reminds me of a narration that was mentioned about Urwa ibn Zubair. Urwa ibn Zubair, he was the son of Zubair ibn Awam. Zubair ibn Awam was the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu Urwa, he had to get his leg amputated, had to get his leg removed. So when they brought doctors in, they said to him, offered him khamar. Back then they didn't have pills that would numb you or needle that would numb you. So what they would do is they would drink alcohol to numb them so that they could remove whatever part of the body they needed to remove. So they offered Urwa some khamar. And Urwa said, have the haram fi dinina. That is haram in my religion. They said, well, what are you going to do while we are you know, removing your leg from your body? How are you going to numb yourself? He said, al subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, I'm going to remember Allah. And it shows you that the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala numbs you to the pain that you experience in this dunya. The remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala numbs you to the pain that you experience in this dunya. Yusuf alayhi salam, what did he say? He said, oh my Lord, prison is more dear to me than what they call me to. I would rather be in prison than to commit fornication or adultery. I would rather be in prison. The remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at the time that he was in prison, he was given da'wah. He wasn't even thinking about being in prison. Because the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala numbs you to the pain that you experience in this dunya. So Uruwa said, I remember Allah. And as he began to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, he fell unconscious. And that's from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the human being, our body, our capacity, our ability to withstand pain is to such, it has its limit. And when it reaches that limit, the body naturally fall unconscious. That's from the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He fell unconscious. When he regained consciousness, Uruwa asked, where's my leg? They said, your leg is here. He picked his leg up and he kissed it and he said, wallahi, Allah knows Ma khatab, uh, that I have never taken a footstep ila ma haram Allah. I've never taken one footstep with you towards something that is haram. Never. I mean, how many of us can say that? That I've never used any part of my body for something that is haram. Something that is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, he said that, you know, if we, what was, what was the point? I want to see who was paying attention. What was my point for even going down that road? Does anyone remember? The dhikr of Allah. The dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. So, showing you that the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala numbs you to the pain that you experience in this life. Give you another short incident. Going back to the first pillar, to uh, the pillars of holding yourself accountable. Self-accountability, the first is to weigh or to compare the blessing of Allah to the sins that you commit. Listen to this incident. قَدِمَ رَجُلٌ إِلَى إِبْرَاهِيمِ بْنِ أَدْهَمْ فَقَالَ يَا شَيْخِ إِنَّ النَّفْسِ تَدْفَعْنِي إِلَى مَعَاصِي فَعِذْنِي مَوْئِذَةً فَقَالَ لَهُ إِبْرَاهِيمِ فَقَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمِ إِذَا دَعَتْكَ نَفْسُكَ إِلَى مَعْصِيَةِ اللَّهِ a man came to one of the scholars of the past, his name was Ibrahim ibn Adam. And he said, oh Shaykh, my soul calls me to commit the haram, to disobey Allah. He said, فَعِذْنِي, give me some mo'ima, give me some admonishment. Give me some admonishment so I can stop committing sin. 
So Ibrahim said to him, he said, no, disobey Allah. Fasihi, disobey Allah. What happens? Nothing wrong with that. Disobey Allah. He said, however, I have five conditions for you. Five conditions. If you can meet these conditions, then go ahead and disobey Allah. Show you the hikmah of the scholars. Number one, the, rajul, the man, he said, فَقَالَ الرَّجُلْ حَتْحَ فَقَالَ إِبْرَهِيمْ إِذَا أَرَدْتَ أَنْ تَعْسِ اللَّهِ فَاخْتَبِي فِي مَكَانَ لَا يَرَاكَ اللَّهُ فِي فَسَكَتَ الرَّجُلْ ثُمَّ قَالَ زِدْنِي فَقَالَ إِبْرَهِيمْ إِذَا أَرَدْتَ أَنْ تَعْسِ اللَّهِ فَلَا تَعْسِهِ فَوْقَ أَرْضِهِ فَقَالَ الرَّجُلْ سُبْحَانَ اللَّهُ وَأَيْنَ أَذْهَبْ وَكُلُّ مَا فِي الْكَوْمُ لِلَّهِ سبحانه وتعالى فَقَالَ إِبْرَهِيمْ أَمَا تَسْتَحِي أَنْ تَعْسِ اللَّهِ وَتَسْكُمْ فَوْقَ أَرْضِهِ The man said, give me the five. Ibrahim, he said, first, he said, if you want to disobey Allah, then go hide in a place where Allah can't see you. Go hide in a place where Allah can't see you. Where you want to go where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can't see you? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees everything. <laughs> the man said, Zid, give me more. He said, secondly, he said, if you want to disobey Allah, then don't disobey Allah on his earth. He said, aren't you embarrassed or ashamed to disobey Allah and then turn around and live on his earth? Aren't you just a least bit of shame I, I, don't you have just a little bit of shame to disobey Allah and then turn around and live on his earth? That's like a person stealing out of your car and then going to sleep in your car. I mean, you know, if you're going to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then get off of his earth. The man said, okay, give me more. فَقَالَ إِبْرَهِيمُ وَقَالَ رَجُلْ زِدْنِي فَقَالَ إِبْرَهِيمُ إِذَا أَرَدْتَ أَنْ تَعْسِ اللَّهِ فَلَا تَأْكُلْ مِنَ رِزْقِهِ فقال الرجل سبحان الله وكيف أعيش وكل نعمة من عند الله سبحانه وتعالى فقال إبراهيم أما تستحي أن تعصي الله وهو يطعمك ويسقيك ويحفظك ويحفظ عليك قوتك So the man, the Ibrahim said to the man number three, if you want to disobey Allah then don't eat from his provision how he feeds you and then you turn around and you bite the hand that feeds you. And, you know, figuratively, obviously. How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep feeding you and then you turn around and disobey him? He's trying to make the man conscious about sin. And a lot of times we don't think about sin in these terms. We think, okay, I'll just make toba. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the full right. We don't think in terms of comparing the ni'mah that Allah has given us to the sins and the transgressions that we commit. He says, so if you're going to disobey Allah, then don't eat from his provision. So the man says, subhanAllah, how am I going to live if I don't eat from his provision? Ibrahim said, aren't you just a least bit of ashamed to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he has bestowed all these blessings and favors upon you? The man said, every ni'mah that I have is from Allah. As Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا بِكُمْ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ فَمِنَ اللَّهِ That you don't have any blessing except that it's from Allah. So then why do we take those same blessings and then turn around and disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with them? Ibrahim فَقَالَ رَجُلْ زِدْنِي فَقَالَ إِبْرَهِيمْ إِذَا عَصَيْتِ اللَّهِ إِذَا عَصَيْتَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ جَاءَتْكَ الْمَلَائِكَ لِتَسُوقَكَ إِلَى النَّارِ فَلَا تَذْهَبْ مَعَ قال الرجل سبحان الله وهل كوا عليهم إنما يسوقوني سوقا فقال إبراهيم فإذا قرأت ذنوبك في صحيفتك فأنكر أن تكون فعلت فعلتها فقال الرجل فإن الكرام الكاتبون وملائكة الحافظون الشهود الناتكون إبراهيم said that if you want to disobey Allah number four if you want to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he said, the next time you disobey Allah, then when the angels of death come to take you to the hellfire, then don't go with them. Don't go with them. He said, how can I refuse not to go with them? They just want to take me and drag me to the hellfire. 
He said, number five, when you read your sins, if you want to disobey a law, then when you read your sins in your book of deeds on the day of judgment, then deny that you did any of it. Deny that you did any of it. He said, well, how can I deny what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kiram and katibun as angels that write down everything? And angels that were there protecting me and was watching over my deeds was shuhud and matikun and my hands and my feet and everything else that's going to testify against me. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, يَوْمَ نَخْتِمُ عَلَىٰ أَثْوَاهِهِمْ وَتُكَلِّمُنَا أَيْدِيهِمْ وَأَرْجُلُهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ That on the day of judgment we will seal their mouths shut and your hands will talk to us and your feet will talk to us about everything that you used to do. As a matter of fact, there's another ayat where the human being will dialogue with his body parts and will say to the body parts, لِمَا شَئِتُمْ عَلَيْنَا Why did you testify against us? And the body parts will talk back to him and say, Kalu and Takana Allah who Ladi Antaka Kulla Shay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that calls us to talk, the one who can make anything talk. This is a dialogue between the human being and his body parts. A rook in the thani, number two from the pillars of Muhasala, upholding yourself accountable. And to me is mad al haq alik, min wujub al rubudiya. والتزام الطاعة واجتناب المعصية وبين ما لك فعليك حق ولك حق فأدي ما عليك يؤتيك ما لك. He said number two from the pillars of self accountability is to distinguish the rights that are for you and the rights that are against you. There are rights that are yours and there are rights that you owe to other people. There are rights that are yours and then there are rights that you owe to other people. He says, so give everybody else their rights, and what is yours will come to you. But today you have, many of us, we're so concerned. We become very narcissistic, because it's all about us, my rights. Every time I, I counsel couples, the first thing the brother or the sister says is, she's not giving me my rights. I'm not getting my rights. It's all about me. As opposed to, what about the rights that you're giving to the other? Abdullah bin Abbas, uh, he mentioned in his commentary of the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَّهُنَّ مِثْلُ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِنَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَلَّهُ رِجَالِ عَلَيْهِنَ دَرَجَةً That the women have similar rights to the rights of the men, but the men have a degree of responsibility over the women. طيب, Abdullah bin Abbas, he said, because of this ayah, I don't ask my wife for every right that is mine out of fear that she will ask me for every right that is hers. <laughs> but yet and still, we have so many shortcomings, but yet and still, we, were, we want everything that belongs to us, but yet and still, we don't want to give everybody what belongs to them. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns this behavior in the Quran with his statement, the Mutafifin is the one that when people owe him, he want his in full. But when he owes other people, he wants to give them a little bit here, a little bit there. You want to shortchange what you owe everybody else, but you want yours in full. MashaAllah to Allah. Same thing, we do with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want Allah to respond to our dua. We want Allah to listen to us. We want Allah to help us. We want Allah to give us success. We want Allah to do this and do this and do this. But what have we done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Have we fulfilled our part of the bargain? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبُ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا لِي That is the condition. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, When my servant asks you about me, tell them that I am near. يعني قريب الإجابة I am near, I am close with a response. I respond to everyone who calls on me, but let them respond to me also. Do we respond to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We kind of, oh Allah, give me this, oh Allah, give me that, I want this, make this easy for me, do this for me, make this easy for me, give me success in this endeavor. But have we responded to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? A thalif, number three, from the pillars of self-accountability and ta'rif anna kullu ta'a 
رضيت بها فهي عليك وكل معصية عيرت بها أخاك فهي إليك He said number three is that every act of good, every act of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you become pleased with, then it is actually working against you. And every sin that you find fault in your brother with, although you do it, then that is actually working against you as well. <clears throat> every sin, every act of ta'a that you become pleased with, then it does not work in your favor. When we do acts of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should be between fear and hope. Not that, you know, alhamdulillah, I've done my job, alhamdulillah, we go to bed at night and we pray five salat, mashallah, and we believe that after we've prayed our five, I'm done for today. What will make you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even accepted one salat from you? We should be in fear when we go to bed, did Allah accept my prayer? Abu Bakr al-Siddiq he said that if I knew for a surety that Allah had accepted from me two rak'ah, it would be better for me than everything in the dunya. Just two rak'ah. We go to bed after making five salat and we believe, khalas, a date ma alayya, I've done my job. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not obligated to accept anything from us. Allah mentions in the Quran that those who do righteous deeds while their hearts are in fear, in fear that Allah won't accept anything from them. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't accept anything. So when we do acts of worship, it's not that we you know we become pleased, you know, alhamdulillah I made hajj. When you come back to America from Hajj, you should be in fear that did I spend all this money and all this time and energy, is that even accepted? Is it even maqbool? We have husnudhan with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe, you know, we, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. But we should never be, so have, our conviction should never be to such a degree that we never look back at the deed and contemplate and reflect on whether or not Allah has accepted it or not. We should be in fear when we do our good deeds as well as trying to find fault with, you know, our brother who may have uh, a sin and we commit the same sin and yet and still we find fault with him for the same sin that we commit. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu in ending, he gave some very beautiful advice. He said, حَاسِبُ أَنفُسَكُمْ قَبْلَ أَنْ تُحَاسِبُ He said, وَزِنُ أَنفُسَكُمْ قَبْلَ أَنْ تُوزِنُ فَإِنَّهُ أَهْوَنُ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الْحِسَابِ غَدًا أَنْ تُحَاسِبُ أَنفُسَكُمْ الْيَوْمُ وَالتَّزَيَّنُوا لِلْعَرْضِ الْأَكْبَرِ قال الله تعالى يوم إذن تعرضون لا يخفى منكم خافية أما عبد الخطاب رضي الله تعالى عنه he said حاسبوا أنفسكم قبل أن تحاسبوا hold yourselves accountable before there come a time when accountability is taken for you it's the same thing that happens in this life with people who are criminals or have criminal behavior and they run the streets and they do whatever they want to do and because they get and take account of themselves, they're put in a place called prison and account is taken for them. So they have a place for people who don't know how to take account of themselves, who live life doing whatever they want to do. And then later on, somebody is telling you when you can wake up, when to go to sleep, when to use the bathroom, when to eat, when to be quiet, when to see your family, when you can't see your family. Somebody else is holding you accountable because you couldn't do it yourself. And that's just a small microcosm of what happened life. Then your reckoning in the hereafter will be very difficult because we didn't hold ourselves accountable. So Omar said, hold yourself accountable. Hold yourselves accountable before accountability is taken for you. He said, and wait your deeds before your deeds are weighed for you. He said, for indeed it is easier for you to hold yourselves accountable today than for you to be held accountable tomorrow, meaning in the hereafter. He said, and beautify yourself, meaning with good deeds, so that when you stand on the day of judgment in front of everyone, that you, know, you will be proud of the deeds that you've done. Because on the day of judgment, everybody is going to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everybody. Naked, uncircumcised, waiting for their judgment. The Prophet ﷺ gave a very descriptive scene of what happens in that situation. He said on the day of judgment, everyone will be standing next to each other, 
naked and uncircumcised. So Aisha said to the Prophet Sallallahu won't the people, you know, male will be standing next to female? The Prophet Sallallahu he mentioned an ayah from the Quran where Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said that every human being on that day will have enough concern of his own to be worried about someone else. No one will be worried about anybody. He said, on that day, while we're standing waiting for judgment, some people will be sweating and their sweat will come up to their ankles. Some people will be sweating and their sweat will come up to their calf. Some people will be sweating and their sweat will come up to their knees and some to their shoulders, some to their waist, some to their shoulders, and some their sweat will go into their mouths. Everyone will sweat based upon the deeds that you know that you have to atone for. The deeds that you have to be held accountable for. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will single out an individual and bring him in front of everyone on the day of judgment. As the Prophet sallallahu said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will single out one individual, min ummati, and will bring him up in front of everybody. Ninety-nine scrolls will be brought out. kullu sijlin basar. 99 scrolls will be brought out, every scroll as far as the eye can see. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to the servant, How tunkiru shay'an? Do you deny any of this? And the servant will say, No. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask them, Wa halaka indana hasanatan aliyom. Do you have any good deed that will outweigh all of these 99 scrolls that are filled with sin? And the servant will say, no, I have no good deeds that can be comparable to this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, yes, you do. La dhulma alayka al-yawm. Inna laka indana hasan. Fa yukhraj bitaqa maktubun alayhi shahadatu an la ilaha illallah Muhammad al-Rasulullah. Fa yuja'al al-bitaqa fi kiffa wa tis'a wa tis'in sajilla fi kiffa wa ma'alat bihinna al-bitaqa. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask the servant, do you have any good deeds? He will say, no, I have no good deeds. Allah says to him, you will not be oppressed today. You do have a good deed. And a card will be brought out. And on the card will be written his shahada. La ilaha illallah. Muhammad Rasulullah. And that card would be put in one scale. And the 99 scrolls will be put in the other scale. And his car with la ilaha illallah will outweigh the 99. Allah, Allah. The, the beauty of this is shows us that we can always renew our deeds. La ilaha illallah is something that is very easy to say on the tongue. Subhanallah wa bihamdi wa subhanallah al-azim. These words are very easy to say on the tongue. Brothers and sisters, make sure your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, your muqiyam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions all throughout the Quran about the weighing of the deeds and about this one having more good deeds than that one. Be careful not to oppress someone so that they take from your good deeds. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to his companions in ending, Atadruna mal muflis. Do you know who is broke? The Sahaba said, Alladhi laysa lahu dinar wa la dirham. The broke person is the one that has no money, no dinar, no dirham. The Prophet sallallahu he said, La al-muflis man yati yawm al-qiyamah wa qad salla wa sama wa hajja wa qad shatama hadha wa akhada maal hadha wa dharaba hadha fa akhada hadha min hasanatihi wa hadha min hasanatihi hatta idha faniyat hasanatuhu Ish? Yaqhud min Sayyati Alladheena Dhalam Alladheena Dhalamahum The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the broke person is the one who comes on the Day of Judgment He fasted, he prayed, he made Hajj, he did all types of good deeds But on the other side of that, he oppressed this one, he took the money of this one, he backbit this one, he hit this one so this person will take from his good deeds, this person will take from his good deeds, this person will take from his good deeds, until he has other people that he oppressed that he owes, and he has no more good deeds. And there's no bargaining, there's no money to bargain with on the Day of Judgment. The Prophet he said, Man kana indahu 
ظلم لأخيه فليؤده إليه قبل أن لا يكون دينارا ولا درهما. He said that whoever has a right that he owes to his brother, then let him repay it today. Because there will come a day where there will be no dinar or letterahem. There will be no money to bargain with. And the day of judgment, you bargain with your good deeds. So if you're in a habit of oppressing people, you're in a habit of disobeying Allah, please make sure you have a mountain of good deeds. Please make sure. Because you have people who spend their lives, Muslims, who spend their lives, you know, oppressing other Muslims. Yet and still, they don't do anything good. So when you run out of good deeds that you owe people, the only thing left for the people to do is for you to take from their bad deeds. And after you take from their bad deeds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the angels to drag you to the hellfire or any other video. Brothers and sisters, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to listen to the best of what we heard and to follow the best of what we heard. Uh, I know that this subject matter was a reminder for, for the most of us, and alhamdulillah, the reminder benefits the believer. Uh, we are living in a time where um, many people are just not spiritual at all, period. Including us as Muslims. And you would think that as Muslims, we pray, we are the only religion that prays five times, structural, five times a day, the only religion in the world that prays that amount of times a day, bare minimum. And some of us are some of the most irreligious people you could come in contact with. I find that very difficult to believe. How is a Muslim not religious or not spiritually connected when you pray five times a day? How is that even possible? But it has happened. Because we don't tend to deal with the soul. We don't deal with those intricate matters of our religion. We stay on the surface. Pray five times a day, fast the month of Ramadan, give salams, give sadaqah, alhamdulillah, make hajj, make umrah, alhamdulillah. But we don't go any deeper than that. We don't work towards purifying the soul and those intricate qualities that make us a human being. Your soul is what makes you a human being. Not your body. Your soul is what makes you a human being. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his tawfiq. In all of our endeavors, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his success in all of our endeavors. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, make our uh, hisab, yasira, make it easy. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to supplicate, Allahumma hasib me hisab and yasira. Oh Allah, give me an easy reckoning on the day of judgment. That we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us an easy reckoning on the day of judgment and not to hold us accountable for the things that we do out of ignorance or the things that we do um, out of forgetfulness. For indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa liyu dhalika wa qadirun ala kulli shayi wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam al-tasleem al-kathira wa rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina adab al-nar Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-huda wa al-tuqa wa al-fafa wa al-ghina Allahumma inna na'udhu bi yudaka min saqatik وبمعافاتك من عقوبتك وبك منك لا نحصي ثناء عليك ولو حرصنا أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك وصل اللهم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته